The Spin-Off Podcast Network. Love news, but find keeping up a bit overwhelming? Well, Newsable is the answer. It's your daily fix of everything worth talking about. I'm your host, Imogen Wells, and in about 15 minutes, I'll bring you what you need to know from Aotearoa and around the world and explain why it matters. Newsable tackles the big stuff without taking itself too seriously. Listen and follow wherever you get your podcasts. When the Facts Change is brought to you by the Spin-Off Podcast Network, in partnership with Kiwi Bank, the bank for Kiwi looking to get ahead in business and in life, a bank that delivers expertise and banking know-how, smart advice for business owners wanting to invest, grow their business or diversify, a bank that adapts with technology through the lens of its people and customers. It is a bank with heart that is driven by its purpose, Kiwi making Kiwi better off. A few weeks ago, I took a trip out to the Wairarapa for a big announcement from the Prime Minister about a thing called He Waka Eka Noa. We're all in the same waka. This was the agricultural sector's response to how to reduce our climate emissions from farming. And the Prime Minister was about to announce how this whole process, He Waka Eka Noa, had gone and the results that the government wanted to produce out of it. Turned out to be quite controversial, but complicated. And so I thought it would be useful to do some things that podcasts are really good at. That's ruminating on a particular topic, going deep on it, thinking about what's actually going on behind the scenes. It made me think about my years growing up on a dairy farm, where I used to watch the cows regurgitate the balls of grass back up their throats, because you could see them coming, have a good old chew, and then back down into one of their several stomachs. And to be a ruminant, because that's what cows and sheep are. That actually matters a lot in New Zealand, the business of ruminating and ruminants, because in that stomach, a whole bunch of methane is being produced. And they do it by eating grass, which is grown with a bunch of nitrogen fertilizer, which then turns at least partly, into nitrous oxide. Why do we care about methane and nitrous oxide? They are the gases that our farmers produce and they are a major part of our climate emissions story and, of course, the basis for Hewaka Ekanoa. Rather than go into the details of all of the different schemes and dreams and plantings and uh, subsidies that Hewaka Ekanoa came up with, I actually wanted to go a bit deeper ruminate on what comes out of those ruminants, why these gases are different from carbon dioxide, why there is a huge need to reduce them even faster than carbon dioxide, how there's a huge opportunity too to reduce Aotearoa's warming of the planet in a very fast way, simply because of the science of climate change when it comes to methane and nitrous oxide. That's this week on When the Facts Change, I talk to Melanie Newfield, who is a science writer with a Substack I'm a fan of, who explains these issues, the science issues around methane and nitrous oxide really well. This week, we're going to go deep into methane and nitrous oxide. We're going to ruminate on what comes out of the ruminants. Welcome to When the Facts Change to Melanie Newfield. Melanie, great to have you here in the studio in Parliament. Yeah, thank you. It's great to be here. Now, I stumbled across your work as a science communicator and writer, an independent one, in your excellent substack called The Turnstone. Could you tell us uh, about what The Turnstone is and, and, and what you're doing with the substack? So... A turnstone is a small bird which likes turning over stones to get food. And so I like turning over metaphorical stones and looking at things and learning about topics. And I have a real passion for making the science behind important issues accessible to everyone. So at the moment, that means I'm writing a lot about climate change um, and trying to make some of the science behind climate change 
something that people can understand. And that's why I found it so useful to to get your substack. And in particular, trying to understand the issue of gases produced by our farms. Part of my job here in Parliament is to try to uh, think about what the farmers are saying, what the policymakers are saying, what the legislation is, what are the issues around our climate emissions from farms, and trying to get a sense of, for example, the Hewaka Ekanoa process, we're all in the same canoe, and the government's decisions over the last um, few months and the decisions that we'll have to make in the years to come, both sides of parliament within the context of the Zero Carbon Act. And you did a really useful thing, which was to go into the science and explain how methane and nitrous oxide, the two main gases produced by our farmers, are different and why they're different and how they warm their planet and how that plays into how we think about our emissions from our farms. And in particular, uh, your first piece was called Off the Grass. And you started off by introducing us to a particular park in Newlands with these most weird and amazing red poles sticking out of the middle of them. Could you tell us about this park? Yeah, so this is Wahinahina Park, and it is the most fabulous dog park, um, huge area, stunning views, and these weird red pipes. And the reason the pipes are there is because Waihenahina Park used to be the Horakiwi landfill. And when landfills, the landfills basically release something called landfill gas, which is a mix of different gases, including methane, carbon dioxide, and various slightly smelly things as well. I can, Um, even though this is radio, I can smell it right now. Yeah, yeah. And the... The immediate problem with landfill gases is that they can build up in pockets from the decomposition of things in the landfill, and they have been known to explode. Apparently, I've never heard of one exploding in New Zealand, but um, they have actually exploded. So, so that's why the pipes the pipes are there come up from the landfill and yep. let the methane out, out. into yep. the atmosphere. Yeah, because otherwise you'd be at risk of. We don't want these things yeah, to blow up. We no. don't basically don't want our landfills or our former landfills blowing up. But there's another problem, and that is that methane is a greenhouse gas. Yeah, and tell so, us tell us about how it's um, heating the atmosphere, how that's a bit different from carbon dioxide, and why we have to think about it differently to what we pump out of the back of our tailpipes of our cars and utes. Yeah, so the crucial, there's there's two crucial things about the difference between carbon dioxide and methane. And one is that methane is about 100 times better than carbon dioxide at capturing heat, which means that in the atmosphere it's a far more effective greenhouse gas. Um, But the other thing is that in the atmosphere methane is relatively short-lived. So carbon dioxide once we've pumped that into the atmosphere, it's hanging around for 300 to 1,000 years. There's some exchange with the oceans, but broadly, it's it's around for a long time. Methane takes about 8 to 10 years and then reacts with ozone and breaks down and then is carbon dioxide. Oh, so, right. So d- does that mean we shouldn't have to worry about it too much if it goes away by itself? So in the in the long term... It's, methane's not the thing to worry about, but in the short term, because it's 100 times better than carbon dioxide, it's a real problem. And the way that scientists describe the ability of methane to heat the atmosphere is they, they've they done a calculation based on how effective it is at capturing heat and how long lived it is. And over a 100-year period, it's about... 25 times worse than carbon dioxide. But that's because it's so short-lived. If you calculate it over a 20-year period, it's 80 times worse. And so it is much, much worse than carbon dioxide. And we know now from the IPCC report that 
the crucial issue for us on climate change is being as fast as we can to reduce our emissions now yeah. to avoid heating the planet to a point at which there's a risk we hit tipping points and then we can't control anything, she's off, it's gone. So the challenge for us as a planet is to find the fastest ways we can to reduce the warming as fast as we can. So it's interesting, in the last couple of years, I've noticed that a lot more of the debate around climate change has shifted from talking about carbon dioxide, reducing carbon dioxide emissions, having less coal plants, having less cars, flying less, or not growing so fast. Uh, and, uh, and people are starting to think about this methane. Could you tell us, it's a big planet, where does the methane come from? What are the, what are the ways that it gets out there and how do we control it? So there are broadly three sources of the methane that's in the atmosphere. And a third is natural sources, which in particular um, wetlands. So when plant material breaks down in wetlands, it releases methane. Same as same process that's happening in the landfill, but it's, it's a natural process. About a third of it comes from fossil fuels. And for example, coal mining, coal has methane trapped in it, um, as we know to our cost from Pike River, which that was methane. So when you're mining coal, that releases methane, which goes into the oh, atmosphere. Wow. So that's a double whammy. It, coal is bad for so many reasons. Um, and then a third of the methane in the atmosphere comes from agriculture. And the majority of that is cattle and beef agriculture. There's a little bit from rice, but the majority is cattle and beef. Ah, so we're getting to the um, crux of the matter for Aotearoa, which is the beef and the sheep and the cows. Now, I grew up on a dairy farm and spent a lot of time looking up at the rear end of a cow, <laughs> hoping to avoid what's coming out, and knowing there was the occasional fart, but there was a lot of burping too. And one of the things I did as a kid was watch cows, often two in a row, sitting down, and me and my brother would bet uh, when the cud was coming up back from the stomach and up into the mouth to chew. And we'd have bets to see who, which cow was fastest, and, you know, it was good fun. But your piece described uh, the process of ruminants, cows and sheep, and how that, that process in the stomach works. Could you talk a bit more about that? Yeah, so basically cows and sheep and deer and goats and things, they, they are able to eat plant material that we can't digest very well. If we ate grass, we'd we get sick, we wouldn't survive. So, it, in fact, cows and sheep can't digest um, grass either. What they have in their stomach is a whole amazing collection of microbes, and it's the microbes that are breaking down the, the grass. And it's, it's an absolute rainforest of different microbes in there, basically. It's all these sorts of different ones. And some of them break down compounds into methane. And then that methane has to escape, and that's the burps. So it's the microbes in that stomach that are breaking down the grass that are the problem. And is there any way that, you know, we can turn off the microbes or get them to do not so much methane? Um, how do we, you know, dial up or, or dial it down if, if we were thinking of trying to do that? So there's definitely research to try and find ways to make cattle and sheep produce less methane. And some of it is actually down to genetics. So there are, they've found, I don't think they've done it for cattle, but they've done it for sheep. They've found sheep which, which burp less methane. And so they're now trying to get that into our national sheep flock um, to low methane emitting sheep. So some of it is down to diet, and so there's quite a lot of work to see if different types of forage can result in different methane and, and different microbes, and then different microbes result in less methane. Um, there are supplements, and for intensive dairy systems where they're all on, you know, being given feed there are supplements that can be added that will reduce the methane that they burp. 
but the the cow actually needs to eat that supplement with every mouthful of food. And if you've got a pasture system, it's much more difficult. So they're working on it, but that, there's that answer. There's also even looking at vaccinating against the microbes that are the worst so that they can adjust the the microbial composition of the stomach. But it's it's really complicated because these microbes are all playing different roles. And if you get if you get the gut microbes and the gut pH and you adjust things wrong, you can get reduced milk production, reduced milk fat, um, cause cows to be less healthy. So you've got to be able to do it in a way that you're still producing healthy animals. When the Facts Change is brought to you in partnership with KiwiBank to help you understand the issues affecting the economy. And that's what their team of experts is here to do too. Here's KiwiBank economist Sabrina Delgado on what's happening with the labour market in Aotearoa. Our slowing economy gives way to higher unemployment and we're seeing tightness in the labour market quickly abating. Both the recovery on the supply side, with our surging migration, boosting labour supply and loosening some very tight labour market conditions. But now a stronger narrative is coming through. As consumer demand cools, so too is the demand for labour. Firms are no longer hiring with the same gusto. Already, unemployment has started to lift from record lows and we expect that to continue throughout 2024. Visit kiwibank.co.nz to stay up to date with detailed economic analysis and forecasts from Sabrina and other KiwiBank experts. They take big issues from both here and overseas and make them relevant to Kiwi businesses. Skinny are helping you show how smart you are with the 1Q Quiz, an all-new, super-challenging and super-quick daily quiz built by The Spin-Off. Every Monday, Skinny are giving you the chance to prove you're smart with the Skinny Extra Credit question. Get it right and you'll get the chance to score yourself some Skinny Extra mobile credit so you can text, call or even video call your group chat and gloat about how big your brain is. T's and C's apply. Ready to rediscover the joys of cycling? With over 300 kilometres of cycle paths across Tamaki Makoto, Jumping on your bike and going for a ride is such a fun way to discover the city from a different perspective. Cycling is getting more and more popular across Auckland, so now's a great time to join the hype and give cycling a go. Head to at.govt forward slash cycling to find your nearest cycleway today. So where are we now in Aotearoa with uh, sheep and beef and dairy cows in terms of how much methane they produce relative to the world's methane output and how important is it for us as a country in terms of our total emissions if you add up the methane and the carbon dioxide and one more we'll talk about in a minute. Yeah. So yeah that this is where it actually gets uncomfortable um, because methane is Using the calculation of 100 years, um, methane is 44% of our emissions. Now, that 100-year figure is a bit misleading because we need solutions now. So if you look at it on the 20-year, it's much, much more than that. It's much more than half. So, And 80% of the methane that New Zealand is emitting comes from cattle and sheep. So it's basically... I think it's cattle and sheep, like goats and deer in there as well. But it's basically, as far as I can tell, the single biggest contributor. And that's a that's an issue for us as we think about you know how we respond. Because we could do a bunch of things. We could reduce our carbon emissions in the cities from transport, from our homes, how we heat, how we generate electricity. And we could do it on farms. How, how close is the science to you know, solving the problem with a seaweed or an injection or um, some, some fancy breeding? Not sure exactly how close the science is, but it's hard to avoid the conclusion that we probably need to have less cattle and sheep um, because we've got, we need answers within you know, 10 years, 20 years, not 100 years. So, and that's yeah. part of the the um, the whole drama around Hewaka Ekanoa is that 
as you say, we don't quite have the technology there yet to do it. We might have it over 40, 50, 60 years. And if you framed the issue as, well, we need to solve this problem by the end of the century and this is what we're going to do, um, you could be a little bit more relaxed about it. But as we mentioned at the start, because of the way that methane is much heatier, if you like, than carbon dioxide over the next 10 to 20 years, it's both a threat in that it's going to do a lot of heating, but it's also an opportunity in that if we could reduce our methane emissions, we could really you know, overperform, if you like, in terms of reducing the heating in the, uh, for the planet. I think the really crucial thing is that what counts is not the accounting to comply with protocols and agreements um, and meet targets. What matters is the overall heating on the atmosphere. And so 44% of our emissions are from methane. If we stopped emitting that 44%, in 10 years, that methane is gone. That methane is not heating the atmosphere anymore. So if we want to make changes fast, we need to deal with methane. And that leaves the... um the challenge in a way for farmers who, you know, in theory, all the load should be on them to reduce the methane. We could, as a country, make a huge difference. But by the same token, um, uh, a just transition would mean that um, everyone shares the load a bit more. And in a way, if you were really going to make an impact fast, you'd have farmers reduce their emissions fast and a lot but at the same token, you'd have people in the city reducing their emissions a lot and fast. Yeah, and there are other ways. Uh, there are ways that people in cities need to reduce, um, can reduce methane. So food waste is a, con- is a big contributor. In particular, food waste that goes into landfill decomposes to form methane. So any organic material going into landfill is decomposing to methane. So, you know, that's probably only 10% of our methane emissions, um, but it's it's still significant. But, I mean, it's also all connected. You know, if farmers are affected, we're all affected as well. Our, our whole country is dependent on that. So it's it's not a case of, you know, putting something on farmers that's not going to affect people in cities. Yeah, no, it's going to affect the overall uh, economy. And then the next gas, which I was fascinated with and hadn't really thought about as a dairy farming boy, um, although I did ride on quite a few fertiliser trucks and the odd fertiliser plane too. That was <laughs> fun. Um, and we used to have this stuff, we could, you could smell it. We called it urea. And um, we thought it was good because it really did help the grass grow. But tell us about nitrous oxide because that's the other one we have beside methane that comes off farms? Yeah, so there are other greenhouse gases apart from carbon dioxide and methane and nitrous oxide has no carbon in it at all, Um, nitrogen and oxygen as the name suggests, but it is 300 times worse than carbon dioxide, I think. I think I think it's more than that, but it's something like 300 times worse and it hangs around in the atmosphere for about 100 years. So it's also bad from that perspective. And nitrous oxide, a lot of the nitrous oxide that ends up in the atmosphere comes from agriculture, or I think the vast majority. And there are two main sources. One is nitrogen fertiliser, and the other is animal urine. There's some from the poo, but it's more the pee. And so basically what happens is if more nitrogen or nitrate ends up on the soil than plants can use, it's got to go somewhere. And it goes two places. One, it goes into the waterways and causes all the delights that we've seen in the Rotorua lakes, for example, um, all that terrible pollution, Um, and the other place it goes is into the atmosphere, and some of that 
not nitrogen that goes into the atmosphere is in the form of nitrous oxide. And so that is, I'm not sure exactly the percentage. I think it's about 10% of our emissions come from nitrous oxide. So it's quite significant. And the nitrogen fertiliser that gets put on the farms, uh, a lot of dairy, but also some sheep as well, are there alternatives and are, are there ways in which you can spread it or use it or treat it so that you don't get quite so much nitrous oxide? Ignoring for, for now the nitrates filtering through into the water issues, we're only going to talk about nitrous oxide, the gas. So something like 80% of the nitrogen applied is not used by plants. 80%? Wow. Something like that. So that's a huge opportunity yeah. as well. If you could avoid the wastage, you wouldn't have to pay so yeah. much for it. Yeah. And I don't know how much – I think you've probably got to over-apply in order to get things to go well. But there's definitely being more effective at applying fertiliser, doing it more accurately um, makes a real difference. Um, and there is a particular chemical that you can apply at the same time, I understand, which can also reduce some of the nitrous oxide uh, emissions. Yeah, so there, there, was a, there was a chemical used until I think 2013 called DCD, um, and I don't know, I've forgotten what it stands for. But Good thing, I'm not going to try and pronounce it either. Yeah. So let's just, DCD, 2013, yeah. this was the great hope. And unfortunately, uh, traces of it were found in milk uh, products that went to China. China decided that they didn't like it. We haven't actually been able to use DCD since then. Yeah. So and I don't know if there are other um, compounds, but there are. Um, it's not an easy. It's yeah. It's not an easy problem to solve. So the combination here is that our farmers produce methane and nitrous oxide, and obviously there's a system here. Uh, if we produce a lot more output, often that's because we've put on more nit nitrous oxide, we've got more cows, and they're chewing through more grass and more, putting out more methane. And the challenge here is how to reduce it in a way that um, allows us to continue to produce uh, um, dairy products and meat products that we can sell to the rest of the world. W what about this argument that um, uh, we have actually been reducing the size of our herds in recent years and therefore we're not adding extra methane to the, uh, uh, the planet and therefore we don't have quite so much of a problem and also from a carbon point of view, Per kilogram of meat and per kilogram of dairy products, we are more efficient, i.e. we don't produce quite so many uh, carbon emissions or methane emissions as other producers, let's say the United States or the Netherlands or whatever. How, um, how true is that, are those arguments? So from what I've read, we have reduced our herd size and that hasn't necessarily been for climate reasons but we have, and that has made a difference. Um, and, yeah, so that, that, is, that is a positive. Um, the, I'm not, there are, I've heard different versions of events about, well, different versions of whether or not we are better or worse in terms of, um, you know, emissions per unit. Um, so some... Some methods of calculating say that we're better um, than, say, intensive dairy production and overseas, and others say it's worse. Um, there's one argument that these sort of low-intensity pasture systems are extremely inefficient because they're using a very large amount of land to produce relatively small amounts of protein and that land could be used in a way which created effective carbon sinks if it wasn't being used for agriculture. So there is that argument. There's also the argument that we are producing our, pro our animal protein off something which humans can't eat. So... A, 
not all the land that we're using to produce beef and dairy and, and sheep can't be used for other purposes, but you know there is a lot of land which isn't great for growing other food crops. Um, and so you can sort of make an argument that that's, you know, it's a good use of, say, sheep, sheep, you know, high country sheep um, can't produce a lot of other food. But there's an awful lot of dairy land that could be producing um, other more efficient forms of food. That don't pump out the methane either. Yeah. And um, and just finally, um, when you think about how the world is addressing methane, a lot of the focus has been so far on carbon and there are various markets around the world where people are trading carbon credits, but they're not necessarily trading methane credits or nitrogen credits, although there is one example in New Zealand of a nitrogen uh, trading uh, scheme for the topo uh, catchment, uh, which has been watched closely by everyone. Um, just finally, how, how uh, hopeful are you that we can get a handle on the methane side of the climate emissions challenge? And uh, how do you think it's going to affect, if you like, the political economy of, of dealing with it? Because it's, it's um, because they're slightly different in the way that they do the heating. It's faster, more powerful, but then goes away earlier. And it's a different bunch of people from, you know, the people driving cars or, or creating electricity. How, how hopeful are you that we're going to get a handle on this? There's things that make me optimistic and things that make me pessimistic. So I'm optimistic because it's something that we can, methane is something where we can make a real difference quite fast to the climate. And it's it's not something which involves a whole lot of individual actions because if you're looking for, you know, every single person to change their behaviour, that is actually really, really tough. When you're talking about industries changing the way they do things, that is often more effective. Um, I'm thinking of an example that has nothing to do with, with, um, which has a lot to do with methane but nothing to do with cattle, is that there's been major changes in how farmers grow rice in the last 40 years in China and it's made quite a difference to the amount of methane emitted um, in, in, in terms of a positive change. So you can see these sort of big industrial, industry-level changes are in some ways easier to implement than every single person changing the behaviour. Um, on the other hand, it's so important to us. You know, we are so dependent on these industries that are big emitters and it's so hard to find solutions and the solutions are not going to come from offsetting. I think that's the other crucial thing is that the first tool in the toolbox that people seem to want to reach for is let's find a way to offset it. And I haven't written an article on the challenges with offsetting, um, but there are a lot of challenges with offsetting and I think the most crucial point to make is that it's only going to ever be a small proportion of the solution. Most of the solution has to come from reducing emissions, and that's hard. Yes, it is hard. I, I'm particularly sympathetic with, on the one hand and on the other hand, that's what uh, people in economics are always saying, so that's, that's great. And uh, I am uh, ultimately... Um, I think optimistic, um, partly because it has to be hardwired, otherwise you'd never get up in the morning. <laughs> Melanie Newfield, uh, who is in the author of the Substack, The Turnstone, and is an independent science writer. Um, thank you so much for coming on to When the Facts Change. Thank you. I appreciate it. When the Facts Change was brought to you by the Spin-Off Podcast Network, together with KiwiBank. Visit kiwibank.co.nz to find out how KiwiBank are making Kiwi better off. 
Are you making the most of your KiwiSaver investment? Generate is an award-winning KiwiSaver provider with a track record of strong long-term performance. Making a smart decision now could add tens of thousands of dollars by the time you reach retirement. Book a no-obligation chat with a Generate KiwiSaver advisor today at generatekiwisaver.co.nz slash advice. A copy of the product disclosure statement is available at generatekiwisaver.co.nz. The issuer of the scheme is Generate Investment Management Limited and of course past performance does not guarantee future returns. The Spin-Off Podcast Network.